All right, it took more hours than I intended, but I finally got my new toy up and running. Score one for the geeks. But here we go. Hopefully you are all rested up because we are doing our math test review right now. So pay very close attention. So I want to start off by saying no, you can't use your iPads to go back. But on the test questions, it tells you what each lesson it's from. You can go back and use your book, turn back to the lesson and read if you feel you have to, or go ahead and use your glossary in the back and look up any terms that you totally don't know the definition of. All right, so let's start off with one from lesson 15. What is the product of five and four? If you don't know what a product is, you could look it up in your book, either in Lesson 15 or the back, and you would find out product means the answer when you multiply. So if you multiplied 5 and 9 together, that answer will give you 45. And look how nice my pen is working. Here's one from Lesson 12. Draw a number line with integers marked from negative 4 to 4. So more terminology for you. If you're not sure what an integer is, you can look it up in the back of your book. It will tell you it is all the counting numbers, 0, and all the negative numbers. So now that we know that and we want it to go from negative 4 to 4, I'll reiterate that a number line is horizontal. I saw somebody try to set one up vertically not too long ago. And just a helpful hint, when I make it, I usually put zero in the middle. And then you'll just have to go, there'll be one. That's where two's gonna go. That's where three's gonna go. And that's where four's gonna go. So go ahead and write them in. One, two, three, four, that's not too tough. The other part, I saw one person doing this. When it comes time to do your negative integers, you just simply count still at zero, right? Only you say negative. So here on the left side would be negative one. Then we write in negative two. Then we would write in negative three. And finally, we would write in negative four. Okay. So a couple people were struggling with that earlier this week. Here we have one where you're going to have to identify your figures. It's all listed out for you in Lesson 12. Remember, if it has an endpoint on one side where it stops, but an arrow on the other side indicating that it goes on for infinity, that is what's known as a ray. Here we have arrows on both sides, indicating that it goes on forever on both sides. The artists in the room might have a tough time with this because in geometry, it's described as a line. But the artists in the room, when they think of a line, they usually think of what's really called a line segment because it has endpoints. It stops on both sides. So we could call this either a line segment, or it's also okay just to call it a segment. And what a segment means is just a piece, right? Just one piece out of many, because lines go on forever, and a line segment is just a piece of the line stopping on both sides. Here we have one coming at us from Lesson 14. A subtraction equation. Do I have terms to combine? No, I don't. Let's go ahead and isolate this variable, right? Get the letter H all by himself. The tricky part we know when you isolate a variable in a subtraction equation is the first term the variable or is the second term the variable? The second term's the variable, right? So it is listed in everybody's book on Lesson 14. What do you do? Put the larger number first and still subtract. So I didn't circle H. I didn't circle equals. 
but 15 is larger than 4. So according to lesson 15, we're going to put 15 first, still subtract since the variable is the second term, and finally 4. Now we have some terms to combine, right? When it's time, because we read equations left to right. So I didn't underline H. I did not underline the equal sign, but I did underline 15 minus 4, and now it's time. Let's drop that combined term answer down, and H is going to equal 11. Check out this one coming at you from lesson 11. Story problems about combining, and we've talked about it a lot. Some plus some more equals a total. An easy enough concept to understand, but sometimes people trip on the reading. You really got to think and visualize. Make a picture in your mind. Think about every sentence or every part of the sentence. Check out the first one. There's 14 girls and 11 boys in the class. That's easy enough to picture, right? What do you see? A classroom with 14 girls and 11 boys. All together, how many students are in the class? That's what they want you to find all together. So is that some of the kids that you're starting with, some more of the kids, or the total of the kids if they're talking about all together? Hopefully you know they're looking for the total. Maybe you'll use a C for class. So what were some of the kids in the class? Well, some of the kids was 14 girls. What was some more of the class? Hey, that's 11 boys. And this is one of those equations we talked about that's so easy, it sometimes gets hard. The rules in algebra, do you combine terms or isolate a variable? You have terms to combine right away. 14 plus 11 is on the same side of the equal sign. So let's just go ahead and combine them. What's 14 plus 11? Hey, that's 25, right? Then we go on. I did not combine my equal sign, nor did I combine my letter C. And there you go. 25 equals C. That's how easy that is. Here's another one. Some plus some more equals the total because that's what it says in lesson 11. And the question we got going on right now is, Mr. Hines needed two cough drops before lunch. And then it tells you, if he had a total of eight cough drops, how many cough drops did he have after lunch? How many cough drops did he have after lunch? And they tell you he had a total of eight cough drops. Well, so eight has to be my total, right? He needed two cough drops before lunch, and they want to know how many he had after lunch. Two sounds like the number that he started with. So some more of the cough drops is what we are trying to find. Maybe you'll use an H for Heinz. And then it's just isolating the variable. So circle two and plus to get your variable all together. Kick it over the other side. And some people still need a reminder when it's an adding equation, you always just go ahead and use the inverse operation, right? Just do the opposite, always. Subtraction is the only time we really have to stop and think. So I did not circle H. I did not circle the equal sign. I did not circle the 8. And I kicked a two and a plus sign so hard that the plus sign broke, right? Changed into minus. So eight minus two. And lastly, I have some terms to combine, right? And I'll just drop down my combined term answer 
when it's time. I read equations left to right. So I'm going to go ahead and write H. I did not underline the equal sign. And 8 minus 2 is 6 cough drops he needed after lunch, right? Okay, not too tough. Check this one out. Coming at us from lesson 15, and I also notated that it is all on page 94 of your book. Talking about the different properties of multiplication. Remember the zero property of multiplication. Pretty easy. Any factor multiplied by a factor of zero will always give a product of zero. Five times zero will be zero. 13 times zero will be zero. A million and six times zero will be a million six. The identity property, that word identity means who you are, right? So if they're talking about who you are, what the number is, any factor multiplied by a factor of one will always give a product of that number. If you multiply 5 by 1, it's not going to change his identity. That's why they named it that, right? 5 times 1 equals 5. A million 23 is going to give you a million 23 if you multiply it by a factor of 1. And lastly, we have the commutative property of multiplication. Commutative property, talking about a community, how they get along together. And this states that if you change the order of the factors, you won't change the product. 8 times 5, hey, that's 40, right? 5 times 8 is also 40. You will not change the product if you change the order of the factors. Check out this one coming at us from lesson 13. Change this addition problem into a multiplication problem. I have seen a few people, when they do this, end up with two different answers. You can't. That's the first indicator right there that you did something wrong. So in this problem, I am adding 9, what appears to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times, right? And we could go ahead and add it all up. And that's going to give us 45. But that's not what they're really asking us to do. They want us to write this as a multiplication problem. So I'm adding 9, right? And I'm adding it five times. So let's go ahead and times or multiply it by five. And the last test, if you figure out the product, it better be the same as the sum when you added it, right? I wasn't sure if I needed to do this or not, but I'm going to just to reiterate how important subtraction is to set up as neatly as possible, right? People are coming over saying, how did I get that wrong? Well, you wrote down the wrong answer somehow. Everybody, I think, is okay with the algorithm itself. It's being neat and skipping out on steps that is messing with some of us. So if you start over here on the right side in the ones column, starting with zero and trying to take away eight, you can't do that. You go to your neighbor and say, hey, man, can I borrow one? And your neighbor says, uh-uh, I'm broke too. So he goes to his neighbor who's holding seven, right? So you cross out seven, write the six, and he can pay one to the neighbor, making him ten. So now he says, hey, good news, I got ten. All right, can I borrow one? Yeah. So 10 becomes 9. Pays the neighbor 1. And now you can start subtracting 10 minus 8. The other mistake we talked about, I sometimes see people trying to cross out this 10, right 9. Why? Who's he paying one to? Nobody, right? Just start subtracting 10 
minus 8 is 2. 9 minus 3, hey, that's going to give us 6. And lastly, 6 minus 1, that's going to give us 5. So we have 562 for the difference, the answer when you subtract. Check out this one coming at us from Lesson 7. In which digit is the hundreds place in 632,468? Remember, the first three digits I call the no-name family, right? And it's the ones, the tens, the hundreds. The next three digits is the thousand family. It also goes one, ten, hundred, only now you have one thousand. 10,000, 100,000. In a few lessons, we're going to learn about the millions family. It also goes 1 million, 10 million, 100 million. So they want to know which digit is just in the hundreds place. Well, the hundreds place appears to be one, two, three places to the left, right? So I think we're talking about the four, because that's 468. So which digit is in the hundreds place? The four is in the hundreds place. Here we have it saying, use digits to write the number 26,012. So remember this thousand, that's just a family name, right? I just have to worry about 26 getting in the thousands place. So I have a two in the ten thousands and a six in the one thousands, right? 26,000. You say the name of the number, then the name of the group. 26,000. If there's a comma after the word, there has to be a comma after the number. Here's the more difficult part where kids sometimes make a mistake. Then you have 12. Well, 12 is just a 1 and a 2, right, Mr. Hines? Yes, it is, but you're in the no-name section, not at the beginning of the number. 12 is 110 and two ones, but it's also zero hundreds, right? When you write a number, you have to use all three of the places, unless it's at the beginning. You don't have to put a zero here at the beginning. Nothing is the same as zero. So 26 comma, 0, 1, 2, 26,000, 12. How much is 5 eighths? Not too tough, and probably the easiest way to think about this would be just multiply. I guess I could go ahead and add it too, but man, I'm a big kid, so I'd rather just go and multiply. Five times eight, hey, that's 40, Mr. Hines, right? That's not too tough. Here we have to compare, but the trickiest part of this job is reading carefully because they have very similar digits all ones, twos, and threes, but I want to draw your attention here. This is 1,332. This is 1,323. So even though they both begin with 1,300, you have two different numbers there. 32 is greater than 23. What is the ninth term in this counting sequence? Well, 6 is the first term, 12 is the second term, 18 is third, 24 is fourth, 30 is the fifth term, and so on and so on. So you would need the sixth term, the seventh term, the eighth term, and the ninth term for our answer, right? Let's take a look what our rule is. We are obviously counting up because the numbers are getting larger. And I better know that I'm counting up by sixes, right? So let's just go follow it through. 30 plus 6 is 36. 36 plus 6 more. Hey, that's going to give us 42. 
42 plus 6 more is 48. And finally, 48 plus 6 more, hey, that's 54. So what is the ninth term? You don't have to show me all your counting, but for sure you better tell me that the ninth term is 54, right? Okay, so that is all I have for you. I think it's fairly well documented that if you finish a test first, nobody in the history of the class has ever gotten the best score on any test they finish first, right? Go slow, use your books if need be, double check everything. All right, good luck.